tonight. So good evening, everybody. Oh, that was terrible. I think you can do better than that. Good evening. There we go. That's much better. Excellent. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for turning out tonight. I know it's a bit chilly, a bit uh, chillier than we were expecting, but thanks, everybody, for, for coming out here tonight. Uh, and welcome. I see many returning faces, so hello to everybody that I already know. Uh, I also see a few new faces here today, so welcome to all of you. Um, for anyone who does not know who I am, uh, my name is Alexandra Elliott. I'm the curator here at Quincy Historical Society, and I will be your speaker this evening. Um, so as you probably already know, we are going to be talking about women's history here tonight, because this is Women's History Month. Um, and I did title this program Beyond Abigail. Now, I know I'm being a little bit cheeky with that title. Um, we love Abigail here in Quincy. Of course we do. Um, she is a remarkable woman, an incredible historical figure. Uh, and all of her work and her letters are just such a treasure trove for what I do here today. However, Abigail is a big star. And sometimes her light can obscure the light of many, many other stars that we have here in Quincy history and all of the other remarkable women who deserve just a little bit of attention. And so I'm, the goal here tonight is to try and provide a little bit more attention to all of those other shining stars in Quincy history. So we're going to be talking about a number of different individuals. Um, and honestly, this is one of the things that I personally love about Quincy history, and that is that any one of these individual women that I'm going to talk about here tonight could be the center of an entire town's or community's historic um, focus. But Quincy, we have a million of them. <laughs> We're very, very lucky here in Quincy with the amount of history that we have. So um, it, it makes my job certainly much more fun because of that. So I'm, I'm very, I feel very lucky to be able to work in this community. And I'm you know, very delighted to be able to bring you uh, a few stories here today about you know, some lesser known Quin Quincy women. Um, one caveat to before we start is that this is not a comprehensive list of every notable Quincy, uh, Quincy woman. Um, that would probably take me three or four days and I assume that you have other places that you need to be. So we're not gonna do a comprehensive list. In fact, if I've forgotten someone that you think deserved to be in this presentation here tonight, please come up after the program and let me know. Um, I'd love to talk about it um, and potentially incorporate them into something else that we're doing as time goes on. Um, anything else that I want to talk about before we get started? Nope, I think we are ready to get to go. All right. So as we begin, um, how do you go about talking about a long list of women without just making it be name, date? They did this, they did this other thing, and then move on and keep going. Um, so I tried to organize it, first of all, chronologically for a little bit of this history, and then to go uh, thematically as well. So these are six of the different sectors that I will be exploring in this, in this program. So that includes uh, Quincy women in public office, in public service, uh, in academia, in business, in, the, in sports, and in the arts. Um, again, like I said, this is not comprehensive, but we've got uh, at least one uh, individual featured in each of these segments. And I, you know, honestly, quite a few of these women could actually be across a whole d number of different themes as well. Many of them had multiple different talents and could really be classified in a number of different ways. Um, so moving on to the first group here. So starting off chronologically, I'm going way back, all the way back to before there was even a Quincy, before there was an old Braintree, before there was a Mount Wollaston. So going back to the pre-colonial period and talking a little bit about Native American history. And Native American history is extremely complicated, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them being that the only primary sources we have when it comes to Native American history tends to be uh, sources that were written by English settlers. Now, they tend to be a bit biased with the prejudices that the settlers had at the time. But then also, uh, depending on who those English settlers were speaking to, they're getting contradictory information from various different tribes and individuals. One of the good examples of that is actually um, the who had more control over Massachusetts. Was it the Massachusetts tribe or was it the Wampanoag tribe? 
There, to this day, it is very hotly debated between these two tribes who actually was subservient, subservient to whom and at what point. Um, so this is something that you run into a lot when you get into Native American history because a lot of these tribes did not write things down, especially here in the Northeast. Um, they didn't have a written record, so we don't have many primary sources from their own perspective. Um, so we're going off of what mostly the English settlers had to say about the Native Americans, um, and then also what we've been able to glean archeologically. So I wanna talk a little bit broadly about who were the native population that lived here in what we now call Quincy. Um, so in Quincy, the main group of Native Americans were known as the Massachusetts tribe. Um, their borders, as I already mentioned, were ill-defined. They probably changed over the years. And um, who they, whether or not they actually had control over this area for a significant length of time is debated. Um, but by the time of uh, English settlers showing up in around 1625, uh, the main group that was in this area were, are known as the Neponset Band of the Massachusetts tribe. And their leader was uh, the great Sachem Chickatobit. So he had his, his main summer seat uh, at Maswatusset Hummock, which is at the northern end of Wollaston Beach. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that. Uh, and so that was one of their main settlements in this area. So I wanna talk a little bit about the role of women in Algonquin culture. And I say Algonquin culture because the Massachusetts were uh, the Algonquin-speaking uh, historical nation. Um, and gender roles were a little bit less strictly defined in Algonquin speaking cultures than they were for the English settlers. Uh, men, both men and women participated in farming practices, fishing, crafting, um, all sorts. It was a little bit more egalitarian, but not completely so. Uh, one of the ways in which it wasn't was that women were very rarely in positions of power, but it did happen. There are at least uh, three female leaders in southern New England that we know of, and one of them I will talk about in just a moment. Now, one other interesting feature is that women's names are very rarely recorded uh, in Native American history, at least when it comes to the Massachusetts tribe and to these Algonquin-speaking uh, and to these Algonquin-speaking groups, and that is because it was considered disrespectful to address a woman by her given name if you were not a member of her tribe or her immediate family. So they were often referred to by um, honorific titles instead of by their, uh, by their first names. So what, happened, what this means is that we don't know the names of a lot of the important women that existed um, in the Massachusetts tribe. Um, so one of the women that I do wanna talk about uh, here today is, has to do with, um, the, as I said, I mentioned Chickatawbit, he was the great sachem of the Massachusetts. And the reason why his summer um, seat may have been here in what is now Quincy is because it is believed that his mother was born here. It is believed that she was buried uh, near Passanagesset or what is known as Broad Meadows. Um, and that it might have been through his matrilineal lineal line that he actually rose to power. Um, there are also primary sources that claim that Chickatawbit directly answered to a female leader. So this was a woman who was referred to in the primary documents as the Squaw Sachem of Mystic. So Mystic referring to the Mystic River up north uh, of the Charles River. Now I do want to talk for a moment about the term squaw. And that is a Algonquin word, which is essentially translates to honored woman and is roughly equivalent in English to a term like madam or ma'am. Um, or actually the best example that I can think of would be the term goody or good wife from if you're reading The Crucible or uh, Nathaniel, ha you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne's stories and you're hearing about goody bishop or goody proctor. Uh, this just meant like honored wife or uh, revered woman. Um, and so the word squaw in the Algonquin language just means an honorable woman. So it, it's, that is the rough equivalent. Um, now that was a term that was appropriated by European and American settlers and was used as a slur, especially against non-Algonquin speaking tribes uh, as American uh, settlement out west uh, continued. Um, and there is an effort currently ongoing by various Algonquin speaking groups, including the Massachusetts that, um, tribes that still exist today and the Wampanoag to reclaim this word because it is part of their language and they are trying to keep their language or revive their language as much as possible. So something to keep in mind as I continue to use this term. 
Um, so the Squaw Sachem of Mystic, she was the widow of another great Sachem, uh, Nana Peshemet, who was, uh, who, and they, she ruled the area north of Boston, so kind of north of the Charles River, around the Mystic River, out west towards Natick, um, and then Revere and up towards Revere and Lynn as well. And she, and she ruled jointly with her three sons. Now, she is credited with having deeded the town or the, the area that is now Cambridge, Watertown, Medford, et cetera, to the English. Um, and there are some, there's at least one record that suggests that when Chickatabit was starting to um, trade and make deals with the English settlers, that in order to do so, he had to speak to the, to the Squaw Sachem before he could agree to anything. Um, but that's just, again, just one um, primary source. And I haven't been able to find any other corroborating evidence, but interesting if it is in fact the case. Moving along. Oh, actually, one quick thing, just on the slides here. So you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, that is a flagstaff that is, I believe, in Medford? No, excuse me, Arlington. Yes, thank you. That's my cheat sheet on the, on the screen there. So in Arlington, Massachusetts, there is a um, flagstaff that does have a depiction of her at the base. And of course, on the, right or on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see an image of Mount Wollaston, um, which was where the first English settlement or, uh, or trading post was set up, and also where it is, or close to where it is believed where Chickataba's mother may have been buried. So moving along into the colonial period. Now I have to be very careful here because this is about Anne Hutchinson. And Anne Hutchinson is quite possibly my favorite uh, Quincy woman in history. I love Anne Hutchinson. I can and will go on about her forever. So I'm going to try and stick to my notes here uh, and not take up too much of the time just talking about Anne Hutchinson here tonight. But who was Anne Hutchinson? Uh, she was a religious teacher and she was also a early settler of Massachusetts and a uh, very devout Puritan. Um, she is popularly referred to as the American Joan of Arc, which kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what her story is going to be like. Um, one of the reasons why I really love her is has to do with some of my theories about why the American Revolution had to start here in Massachusetts. And really, the intellectual seeds of the revolution are here in Quincy. And I believe, or there is, there is an argument to be made that it was Anne Hutchinson who planted those seeds and that that rebellious nature and that rebellious story actually started with her and really just never left Quincy. Um, so who is Anne Hutchinson? Uh, she it was born in the fit, late 1500s. Uh, she is the daughter of a Anglican minister, but this is before the split of the Puritans off from the Anglican church. Uh, and she is remarkably well-educated for a woman at her time. Uh, traditionally, women were not educated, but one interesting thing about the Puritans is that there was a tenet within their religion that everybody, boys and girls, had to be able to read and write, at least in a basic sense, because you had to be able to read your Bible to be, it must be able to understand what it said for yourself. So boys and girls in the Puritan church were educated up to you know, a basic level, um, but Anne was even more well educated than that because her husband, or excuse me, her father was a minister and he believed that his girls should be just as well educated as his boys. And, she, and so he taught her theology and she could argue and discuss theology as well as anybody else in the community. Um, now, I should also define what is a Puritan. <laughs> um, this is a term that gets thrown around quite a lot, but very few people actually you know, ever define it. So a Puritan is essentially a radical subset of the Anglican Church. So these are people who thought that after the uh, Protestant Reformation in England, that the Anglican Church was still way too Catholic and thus they wanted to purify it. And so they wanted to strip it of um, various ceremonies, um, various holidays, and, and go, get down to something that was a little bit much, much stricter and uh, much more basic. Um, one thing that they believed in uh, that is crucial to think of it, uh, when I'm talking about this is the concept of predestination, which is that the Puritans believed that God had already decided who was going to heaven and who wasn't, um, and that they also believed that whatever happens in your life or whatever goes on in your life in, on this, in this earthly realm really didn't matter. All that matters is getting into heaven. So this explains why they didn't like things like plays or dancing or anything fun, really. Okay. Um, the only fun thing that they allowed people to do was drink, but that was mostly to do with the quality of water as opposed to anything else. Now, 
Another interesting thing about um, Puritan culture is that they allowed non-ministers to essentially hold Bible studies in their homes in between you know, the Sunday Sabbath. And these were often led by women. So women were allowed to, to have a small amount of power within these communities by leading these um, Bible studies. And Anne Hutchinson absolutely did this herself. And she was known for having very large meetings because you know, she could argue theology as well as any of the ministers could. So she was very, a very popular um, person before this. Um, her husband, William Hutchinson, was a wealth, wealthy textile merchant. Uh, and when she and her husband arrived in Boston in 1634, they built one of the largest and grandest houses in Boston at the time. Uh, it was located uh, down in Downtown Crossing, what is now the, or what was once the old corner bookshop, uh, and is now Chipotle. Um, they were also granted one of the largest land grants uh, in the Mount Wollaston settlement. So in Quincy, they got one of the biggest parcels of land when they came out here. So they had their very lovely townhouse, and they had their very lovely country estate as well. Um, so one of the interesting things about why Anne Hutchinson came over here is because she was a follower of a Puritan minister known as John Cotton. Uh, she was also the uh, sister-in-law of another minister who was the minister for the North Precinct of, or excuse me, who was the, the minister for Mount, the Mount Wollaston Parish, uh, that being Reverend John Wheelwright. <clears throat> Both of these men would eventually be accused of being what are called antinomians, which is a really, really long explanation, but it boils down to people thought they were anarchists. Uh, they were not. Um, now, when I get into talking about Anne Hutchinson, I have to start talking about the minutia of uh, Puritan theology, and it gets really complicated really quickly. In fact, my favorite quote about this, uh, this antinomian controversy, the, the Anne Hutchinson controversy, comes from Charles Francis Adams in his book, Three Episodes of Massachusetts History. Not only were the points in dispute obscure, but, this, but the discussion was carried on in a jargon which has become unintelligible, and from a theological point of view, it is now devoid of interest. So it's largely unimportant to actually what they were arguing over, but you are going to have to trust me when I say that this was not existential to the existence of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They were really upset about all of this. The dispute boils down to it was, how do you know that you have God's favor in the Puritan church? There were two ways in which the Puritan minister said that you could discover that you have God's favor. One was through the covenant of works, which is basically how closely you adhere to all of the very detailed and strict social rules of the Puritan setup. So like wearing certain colors if only if you work in certain professions and making sure that you always go to you know, the services on Sunday and, and just making sure that you stay, excuse me, that you stay in the lines uh, socially. The other way that you could be sure that you were that you had God's grace was through the covenant of grace. And that is basically boils down to a feeling in your heart that you are a good person. <laughs> These things can be contradictory. Uh, if you are seriously interested in Anne Hutchinson after this talk, I highly recommend a blog post that I wrote about it um, on our blog, the Quincy History blog, so you can absolutely learn more about her. I dive a little bit more into this theology and explain it a little bit more in depth. But just for tonight, we're going to leave it at that. Um, basically, what happens with the antinomian controversy is that uh, Reverend Cotton and Reverend Realwright preached that the covenant of, of grace uh, were more important than the covenant of works. Uh, and so that you, know, you should still follow the covenant of works and still follow the rules, but really it's what gets in your heart that matters. Uh, this, like I said, is an existential crisis for uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Cotton and Wheelwright are immediately uh, thrust into a world of legal trouble over this. Cotton immediately recants and walks his beliefs back. Wheel Reverend Wheelwright did not. He doubles down, and he ends up getting banished immediately. Um, Meanwhile, Anne Hutchinson, the main character of the story, uh, was always continuing to lead her Bible studies and continuing to preach. Grace was more important than the covenant of works, um, which of course the local ministers did not appreciate. And also she was pointing out that, you know, the ministers were preaching about the covenant of works, well, they're all hypocrites anyway. So, <laughs> so she got in trouble pretty quickly. So she's put on trial, and ultimately she is banished um, for her beliefs. She, refused to, she refuses to recant them. Um, 
um, and found the colony of Rhode Island um, and eventually uh, has to move down to the Bronx into New York, New York and is actually ends up being killed in a Native American raid on her home uh, in that area. Um, so it's a very sad end to her story, but her line continues on. In fact, the royal governor of Massachusetts during the revolution, uh, Governor Thomas Hutchinson, is her grandson uh, through her 14 children. Yes. <laughs> So yes, so Anne Hutchinson, like I said, she is absolutely one of my favorite uh, characters in history, much less in Quincy, or including Quincy history. You know, she has a real voice of her own, and it shines through in her trial testimony. Um, she knows what she believes to be true, and she really sticks to her guns. And you know, that's worth worth remembering her about that. I think we should maybe talk a little bit about the Quincy family because the Quincy family is obviously quite important in Quincy history, being the family that the city is named after. Um, Quincy family, uh, you know, goes all the way back to these first settlers, but we've got a number of significant women in the Quincy family as well. Two of them being the Dorothys. Now, of course, I'm sure that you are all aware of the Dorothy Quincy Homestead that we have just up the street, the beautiful historic uh, house museum that we have. Well, did you know that there's more than one Dorothy Q? Well, now you do. Um, so there are, I think there's actually more than two, but I'm only going to talk about uh, two of the Dorothy Qs here tonight. The first one is Dorothy Quincy Jackson, um, and she was um, a very, very early, I think, born in the 17, around 1700. Um, and she is the person for whom the poem Dorothy Q was written by her uh, grandson, or great 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 grandson, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. in 1871. And so to talk to you a little, or to quote from that poem a little bit, he's actually writing about this portrait that you see on the left hand side of the screen. O oh, damsel Dorothy, Dorothy Q, strange is the gift that I owe to you, such a gift as never a king save to a daughter or son might bring. All my tenure of heart and hand, all my title of house and land, mother and sister and child and wife, and joy and sorrow and death and life. What if in a hundred years ago those close shut, shut lips had answered no? When forth the tremula, tremulous question came that, that cost the maiden her Norman name. And under that, the folds that look so still, the bodice swelled and the bosoms thrilled. Should I be I or would it be one tenth another and nine tenths me? <laughs> so he's reflecting back upon what, um, how the, uh, the whims of fate and the whims of this you know, very young woman when she's proposed to and, why, and when she said yes to her particular husband has resulted in him be, you know, being where he was uh, that day. So it's a very nice poem kind of tying into genealogy and, and all the things that you know, we're interested in here. So on the Right hand side of the screen, we have the other Dorothy Q, that being Dorothy Quincy Hancock. And of course, she is most famous for being the first first lady of Massachusetts and the wife of the founding father, John Hancock, and another. And John Hancock, of course, he was born on, on a house that was once on this site, in fact. So uh, Dorothy Quincy Hancock uh, grew up at the Dorothy Quincy Homestead until about the age of 10, I believe. Um, but the family ended up having to leave the house uh, for financial reasons. And so when she began courting, unfortunately, she probably did not meet with John Hancock in the house itself, as the rumor uh, often gets spread. Uh, so I'm very sorry to have to quash that here tonight. But um, the truth of it is that she probably would not have been in that house at that time. Um, what's interesting, actually, is that we don't know a lot about her marriage or really much at all about her life. She doesn't write very much. Unlike Abigail, she doesn't write too many letters. She doesn't keep a diary. Um, in fact, we have letters from John Hancock writing to her saying, could you write to me more often than you do? Um, she has a very sad life from what we do know. She, uh, she and John had two children, neither of whom survive into adulthood. Um, and she, she does seem to have gone into her marriage with open eyes when she marries John Hancock. Um, he was literally a wanted man. He literally has a, a, a price on his head. Um, and she is definitely a very strong-willed woman. Before their marriage, um, Dorothy's father was very ill, and she was down with John Hancock, I believe in Connecticut at the time, and as they're preparing to get married, and she, and she insists on traveling back to Quincy to see him and, and take care of him um, you know, before the worst should happen and go, and go back to Braintree. And Hancock 
says, you know, it's too dangerous, you can't travel alone, you're, you know, connected to me, people are gonna, you're, you're gonna get in trouble. And she says, you are not yet my master, sir, I will go where I wish. <laughs> so she's a very interesting lady. All right, so I am going to talk about at least one Adams woman here tonight, and that being Louisa Catherine Adams. Um, she often does not get as much attention as I feel that she should. In fact, I've started diving into more of her writings recently, and I've really found that she is you know, quite remarkable and quite no noteworthy in a way that um, you know, she doesn't get enough credit for. Abigail obviously gets a lot of notice for being a tremendous writer, and she absolutely is, but Louisa Catherine is notable in a slightly different way, so let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so Louisa Catherine Adams, uh, she's most famous for being the first foreign-born uh, first lady and the wife of the sixth president, John Quincy Adams. Um, quite honestly, um, the fact that John Quincy Adams ever won an election is probably in no small part due to Louisa Catherine. Um, she was known for being an excellent hostess. She was known for being extremely charming, and John Quincy Adams was not. Um, <laughs> So she was definitely knew how to work a room, as they say. Uh, so she was born in London to a very wealthy merchant family. Her father was American, uh, I believe from Maryland. Um, and politically, he was in favor of the revolution, despite him living in London. So at various points, he had to go back to America for a while and before he could resume his um, business back in London because of his um, patriotic sympathies. Um, but Louisa grew up in British high society. She had the best of the best of the best uh, in her upbringing. Uh, because of this, she knew how to walk in the halls of power and how to move through them gracefully and how to win people over. So she could go into a royal court and behave appropriately. She could walk into a, you know, a tea room and make sure and charm all the other people that are in it. She was excellent at the sort of um, drawing room politics, shall we say. Um, so her marriage to John Quincy Adams was a little bit less the stuff of legends as the relationship between John Adams and Abigail Adams. Um, Louise's family was on the verge of bankruptcy when they got married, and it's not clear whether or not Adams actually knew that when they got married, and so uh, her dowry never got paid because the family had to declare bankruptcy like a day or two or a few weeks after they got married. So. This was an early strain on their marriage. Um, Abigail also was very much against the match. She thought that Louisa was a little bit too delicate uh, to be the wife of a hardy New Englander um, and that she wouldn't you know, survive here in our, our very harsh New England winters as we are, discover or as we are experiencing right at the moment. Um, there is, however, a lot of evidence that John Quincy Adams had quite a bit of affection for Louisa. Um, their letters at points get quite steamy, in fact. Um, so, and he's often writing her love poems as well. So there is quite a lot of affection between the two of them, even though there are very rocky patches. Um, but John Quincy Adams also leaves her alone quite often and leaves her isolated in ways like he'll be going off, oh, I have to go take care of, you know, I have to go you know, negotiate the end of this war, darling. I'm, I'm leaving you here uh, by yourself in a country that you don't know anyone in. Um, so that app happens a few times over the course of their marriage. Um, and Louisa does frequently struggle with illnesses, possibly even depression. Um, she, it, this might have something to do with the fact that she was pregnant 14 times. Um, she, unfortunately, she does suffer from multiple miscarriages. I think the, the count is up to nine. Um, she suffers through a stillbirth and not to mention the um, death of their infant daughter in Russia. Um, and two of her, their older sons as well die tragically when, uh, when they are adults. So she has a lot of tragedy in her life, and the Adamses generally do as well. Um, but there's also evidence, or there isn't much evidence to suggest that John Quincy Adams relied on Louisa's um, advice nearly as much as John did on Abigail. Um, and quite honestly, I would say that that would be to his detriment. She, what we see in her writings is that Louisa is a tremendous judge of character. She can see through people extremely well, and then when she writes about them in her diaries or in her letters, she is an extremely uh, adept observer of people. She's describing them. She's able to parse out their motivations. She knows exactly what they're looking for or, or whatever nefarious schemes that they have going on. She's extremely adept at, uh, at understanding people. 
Um, she's also extremely clear-eyed with regards to the Republic. Um, the Adamses, John, Abigail, John Quincy, tend to be very starry-eyed and have big ideals and have you know, a, a very optimistic view of how everything was working out. And uh, Louisa Catherine in her journal, she's, she says often, you know, I would never say this to my husband, but things aren't going as well as he thinks they are. Yeah. Um, so one quote that I do wanna take out from her diary though is actually an observation that she makes about John Quincy Adams to give you an example of what I'm talking about. So this was something that she wrote in her journal uh, on March 12th in 1820, while John Quincy Adams was still the Secretary of State. I have seen too much of public life, not to value it for what it is worth. I think, however, I know my husband's character and with the conviction that his habits and tastes are fixed beyond the possibility of change, I fear that he could not live long out of an active sphere of public life and that it is absolutely essential to his existence. So John Quincy in his diaries often set, gets frustrated and it says something like, oh, I'm, once, once this commission is over, once this task is over, I'm, I quit, I'm getting out of here, I'm, I'm resigning, retiring from public life and you know, letting the chips fall where they do and he never does. Um, he always goes back, he, there's always, up until his death, he literally has a stroke, I believe, uh, on the House uh, chamber floor while he is uh, fighting against uh, the American involvement in the, Spanish, in the um, uh, war within a war in Texas. So yeah, so he is, um, <laughs> she, has, she has his number pretty accurately. Um, so that is Louisa, and I think that we, you know, a little bit more love for Louisa would be a good idea. So moving on to a little bit, uh, again, talking about some of the great families of, of um, Quincy um, and talking about how they've, you know, various women over the years have dealt with the dynastic legacies that have come up um, over the years. So starting off on the left-hand side of the screen, we have Louise, uh, excuse me, Eliza Susan Quincy. So of course she is a, uh, a scion of the Quincy family. Um, she is the daughter of Josiah Quincy III, the great mayor for whom Quincy Market is named, great mayor of Boston. He's also the president of Harvard at a, at a time. And she is the granddaughter of Josiah Quincy Jr., who is uh, the patriot. So he was the um, co, co counsel with John Adams on the um, Boston Massacre trial case. So she is one of five sisters, and their great grandnephew called them the Articulate Sisters because of their ability to write. And so on the screen there, you see the uh, title page from the Articulate Sisters, which their great grandnephew wrote about um, his, his great aunts. Um, she's an artist. Uh, she mostly does monochrome landscapes. We actually don't have any images of her, so I just had some of her painting there in the background. Um, this, these are actually a fantastic resource for uh, the pre-industrial historic homes in Quincy um, because she manages to capture them before anything else is built up around them. So the, the, there's one of them, it's the only record we have of the original Quincy homestead. So before the Dorothy Quincy house was built, the, the original um, homestead that was on that property because it got torn down. And so that's, this is all we have left is from her paintings. Um, she was also very invested in curating the uh, legacy of her family. So she edited or helped to edit the papers of Josiah Quincy Jr. and also wrote his first biography. However, during her life, or at least for at first, she did not want to claim credit for this work. She said that it was her father who did that, not herself, and that she didn't have anything to do with it. Um, and she also likely did this with her father's papers and his biography, which she then credited to her brother. But it really, she was, you know, it wasn't until the second or third edition came out that, of these papers that it was said that, no, it really was Eliza, Su uh, uh, yeah, Eliza Susan that was involved with curating all of these papers. So she was a remarkably talented woman, but she um, felt that she needed to keep a lid on that talent. And it, she was apparently a very big fan of Jane Austen, um, and corresponded with Austin's brother, however, uh, never really took it into her head to, to write a novel for herself, even though she probably could have. It, by all accounts, it seems that she was very comfortable being, um, remaining within the social spheres that were allowed to women at the time and that she didn't feel the need to stray beyond that. Um, and that's where she was most comfortable. On the other hand, um, and on the other side of the screen, we have Abigail Adams Homan. So this was uh, the uh, member of the, I believe, the fifth generation of the Adams family. 
uh, probably the end of the line of the, of the really famous Adamses. Uh, she was the daughter of John Quincy Adams II and the granddaughter of Charles Francis Adams, uh, who was the um, um, diplomat to Britain during the Civil War. Um, she grew up in Quincy, and her father died when she was very young. So she was raised, raised largely by her uncles, Charles Francis Adams Jr., who was actually the founder of the Quincy Historical Society, Brooks Adams and Henry Adams, who were both writers and, and um, artists in their own sense. So she did write a book about this experience, An Education by Uncles, and I have the title page for that up on the screen as well, um, where she writes very irreverently but affectionately about uh, her take on the family and on its legacy. Um, for example, she talks about a time that um, her uncle Brooks Adams took her to Paris and then ditched her there in a convent while he went back to fight in the Spanish-American War. And he just left her there. Um, and uh, she starts the book off basically by saying, the Quincy in which I grew up is dead as a dodo. And she implies that this was actually a good thing, uh, that it was changing and that it was evolving and becoming something more dynamic and, and bigger and better. Um, she eventually moves to Boston when she's married, really truly becomes like a, a Boston Brahmin. Uh, she's known for being quite no-nonsense, blunt and sassy. Um, and there's one story from, um, her, from her obituary, which involves her going to, or, or in the middle of a blizzard, she's traveling through Back Bay, and the blizzard is so bad she stops at the Somerset Club, at which her, her husband is a member. It's a very um, elite and prestigious um, social club. And she's saying, like, it's so cold, the weather's so bad, I, I can't continue on, so can I get a room? Can, can, you give, can you make up a room for me? And the people at the desk say, well, no, you're a woman traveling by yourself. If you're, we can't, even if your husband's a member, we can't make a room just for you. And she says, okay, well, I'll go get my cab driver then. <laughs> um, so she was a bit of a character, as you can tell. Now we get into the portion of the talk where I start approaching things a little bit more thematically. So talking about Quincy women in the political scene. So we're gonna start off with Adelaide Claflin. Um, so Adelaide uh, is, the f is famous for being the first, or not so much famous, but she's interesting for being the first elected woman to a, or to a elected position in Quincy. Um, so she was born in Boston. Her parents both supported her education very heavily. And after high school, she actually got, managed to get private lessons with Harvard professors, because women were not allowed to attend Harvard at the time, but she got some private, private tut tutorials. Uh, when she got married in 1870, she and her husband moved to Quincy, where she became very active in the local suffrage movement. Um, and in 1884, she was the first woman to be elected to public office on the school committee. Um, and she served in that position for about three years, as well as being very active in many of the other social um, organizations. Now, what's interesting about her is that we had no idea that she existed for a good amount of time. For a very, very long time, we believed that it was a woman by the name of Mabel Adams, who was also elected to the, to the school committee, who was the first elected uh, woman in Quincy. However, it was one of our board members, um, uh, Wayne Miller, who also edits our wonderful newsletter, um, and who dug up Adelaide Claflin's story and took it on and wrote about it in the newsletter. And so we have we completely revised uh, Quincy history there and, and uh, found rediscovered an important individual. Um, now, around, after the time that she uh, stopped being a uh, a member of the school committee, she felt called to become a, a minister and ended up going to Chicago to the Meadville Theological School for a number of years, where she eventually graduated and became a Unitarian minister until her death in uh, 1931. Now, on the other side of the screen, we have Edna B. Austin, which members may recognize from our latest newsletter. Um, Wayne just wrote a biography of her life in the latest issue. Um, so Edna was born in Maine to an intellectually rigorous family. Apparently the, the rule about not talking politics at the dinner table did not apply in her family household. Uh, she was an avid outdoors woman and very accomplished equestrian. Um, Austin and her husband ended up moving to Quincy in the 1920s as her husband accepted a position at the Quincy Public Schools. 
Um, she became a lawyer in 1930 and opened a practice down the street uh, on Hancock Street, actually. So she was a lawyer as well as um, an activist and, again, also uh, very active in the various women's groups in Quincy at the time. She first ran for office in 1934 but came in dead last for a city council, so she did not actually uh, win that race. But the second time she ran, in 1943, she won by a landslide and became the first woman elected to the city council um, in Quincy. She, can, she served for 15 years off and on with a gap of about three years in the middle there. And in 1954, she became the first chairwoman of the city council as well. Um, and then eventually retired from politics in uh, 1959. So again, another very accomplished uh, individual. And like I said, if you're interested in hearing more about uh, all of these very interesting individuals in Quincy history, I recommend becoming a member so that you can receive uh, our, our newsletter. It is wonderful. So Quincy Women in Public Service. Um, these are also two of my favorite women in Quincy history, I will be honest, uh, especially the first one that I'm gonna talk about, Molly Dusen or Mary Dusen. She preferred going by Molly, so I'm gonna to refer to her as such. So Molly Dusen was born in Quincy to, and attended the Dana Hall School and Wellesley College. Uh, she began her career as a social worker, advocating for women's rights, labor reform, education, and also reform within the criminal justice system. Uh, and it was through this work that she met her lifelong partner, uh, Mary, also known as Polly Porter, uh, during this phase of her life. So both women became involved in the suffrage movement during the final push to pass the 19th Amendment. And after serving with the Red Cross in World War I, Dusen moved to New York and got and began getting heavily involved in the um, social work se working scene and social causes uh, down there. Uh, and that was how she became acquainted with a woman by the name of Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president, she was highly active in New York Democratic and the New York Democratic Party and worked to get women placed uh, in the FDR administration, including Frances Perkins, the first uh, female cabinet minister or excuse me, cabinet secretary um, as the Secretary of Labor, um, whom you may have come to the performance by one of our, our regulars, um, Janet Parnes, who did a uh, performance at, about the life of uh, Frances Perkins for us a, a few months ago. Um, now, Dusen was crucial and considered crucial. In fact, FDR used to call her uh, the little general because of how organized and, uh, and dogged she was about getting things done. Uh, so she was crucial in the education campaigns around the New Deal, specifically in, in teaching women how to apply for the various uh, programs that were being uh, debuted during this, this period. Um, eventually, she was named to the Social Security Board and oversaw the re reorganization of that, um, of that uh, word I'm looking for, is the, the institution, and made that program more efficient. Uh, she left public life in 1938 due to a, an illness and ended up in her retirement, splitting her time between New York and Maine for the remainder of her life. Now, on the right-hand side of the screen, we have Mary Parker Follett. Uh, this is someone who is not very well known, except unless, if you are very heavy in the management theory uh, academia. Um, so a few years ago, actually, Ed told me a story about a woman who visited all the way from Ireland and was appalled to find out that there wasn't just that our museum was not just dedicated to um, Mary Parker, Parker Follett. Um, a bit of a niche request, but, you know, <laughs> we're, we're working on it. Um, so Mary Parker Follett, she was also a social worker, but she was also a philosopher in the area of business and organizational management. Um, so I have not read any of her of her books, but from what I gather of her philosophy and of her work is that it has to do with institutional organization and how leaders within that can you know, get the best result um, from that. And apparently this revolutionized how management was done in the country. So she was born in Quincy to a wealthy family. She attended Thayer Academy, Cambridge University, Radcliffe College, and eventually Harvard when they started uh, admitting women. Uh, and while attending college, she met the woman who would become uh, her life partner uh, by the name of Isabel Briggs. Um, she was tapped by President Theodore Roosevelt uh, to be his personal consultant on managing nonprofit, non-governmental, and volunteer organizations, so she had the ear of a president. Uh, she wrote a number of books on the subject of management, 
And just to kind of give you a taste of, of what her philosophy was like, I've got a quote here for you. So this is from her book, The Creative Experience from 1924. Leadership is not defined by the exercise of power, but by the capacity to increase the sense of power among those led. The most essential work of the leader is to create more leaders. So there you have it. Moving on to academia. So we have two women here who were very influential in, in academia, um, or certainly interesting within academia. So first off, we have a woman by the name of Alice Bach Gould. Um, she was a mathematician, a philosopher, and a historian. And she, too, actually is a descendant of the Quincy family. Uh, she was born in Cambridge, but actually grew up oh, excuse me, uh, around the Quincy Mansion, which is, uh, used to be on the campus of, the Eastern, of Eastern Nazarene. Um, she's also spent a good amount of her childhood in South America, which influenced her later career. Um, she attended Radcliffe College, Bryn Mawr, MIT, and Cambridge University. Uh, and mainly, she was interested in the, the sciences and, and STEM. Uh, she, but she also did quite a bit of extensive research in Spain about the voyages of Columbus and the Spanish colonization of the Americas. Uh, her most influential work in the realm of history included a publication where she tracked down all of Columbus's crew and identified all but three of them and figured out their biographies and, and who they were and where they came from and actually changed the scholarship on that. It was previously believed that uh, Columbus had just recruited you know, um, deserters from the army and uh, just raided the jails and gotten people and gotten you know, the worst of the worst and criminals. And it turned out that, no, these were just regular people and sailors. Um, so she really did ch uh, change the scholarship on that subject. On the right-hand side of the screen, we have Mary Agnes Reardon. Uh, she was born in Quincy, attended Radcliffe and Yale, and she was an artist and an art professor. Um, she's known for being mostly a, an accomplished liturgical fresco artist uh, and an illustrator for children's books. Uh, her frescoes are located around the country, including quite a few here in Massachusetts, but also in um, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and St. Louis. Uh, she illustrated also, you might recognize it, her most famous illustrated book is called um, The Snow Treasure from 1942. If you saw the, unfortunately I didn't grab a picture of the illustrations, but if you saw the illustrations, it, it probably would look familiar. And then she was also, starting in the 1950s, a professor of art at Emanuel College. Now in business, we have a number of individuals that I want to talk about. Uh, the first two are Christiana and Genevieve Lee. So uh, they are accidental entrepreneurs, uh, shall we say. So Gen uh, Christiana Lee was the wife of a man by the name of Joseph Lee. Joseph Lee was a African-American man who uh, was the manager of the Squantum Inn, out in Squantum, of course. And after his death in 1908, uh, the Squantum Inn obviously needed a new manager, but uh, Joseph Lee was, A, one of the most popular uh, fish frying experts in the state. He was also the inventor of uh, two revolutionary machines in the um, uh, food service industry, that being a bread, automatic bread crumbing machine, where you could take stale bread and turn it into bread crumbs, uh, and then also an automatic dough kneading machine, so you could get like the perfect uh, a batch of, of, of roll dough uh, the, every time. Uh, so they took these inventions, they took the, this um, recipes that he had, and they opened uh, Lee's Inn out in Squantum as well, around the corner from the, the Squantum Inn. Um, so they opened that in 1909 and uh, continued to run it until Christian, Christiana's death in 1916. <laughs> On the other side of the screen, we have Sherry McCoy. She was the former CEO of Avon Products and Johnson & Johnson. She's also a scientist and an inventor. She owns... Uh, several patents under her name, and was named uh, on the Forbes Top 50 Women in Business. So just a brief little biography there. She is still alive and still with us, in fact, and still continuing to uh, do great things in her, her industry. But that also brings me to Rose Cherubini. So Rose Cherubini is someone who came onto our radar quite accidentally in the past few years. Um, she's a fashion designer and a business owner. Um, this actually came about because we had an individual come to us and asked me to look into the history of their home and to find out, you know, who had lived there before, who were they, find some information. And as I was doing some digging, I found Rose Cherubini. 
and it turns out that she is quite an interesting lady. So Rose was born in Somerville uh, in 1913 and started making her own clothes from a very young age. Uh, her uncle was also a dress designer, and so there was quite often a lot of extra fabric, fabric sitting around the house. So she would make, you know, just from scraps of fabric, she would whip up a dress and apparently, you know, disappear from her friends, go whip something up, come down, and just to impress her friends. Apparently she also literally made dresses out of the curtain sometimes. Um, in 1934, she was married to Columbo, Columbo Cherubini, uh, a Quincy native, and who worked in the oil and gas industry here in Quincy. Uh, and in 1950, she opened a shop, uh, her first shop on Hancock Street, actually down the street, uh, roughly where the uh, Quincy College building and the President's Place building is today. Um, over her career, she owned her, her own shop several times, including here in Quincy a couple times, but also in Boston on Newbury Street and Clarendon Street. She also worked as the official designer for several of Boston's eminent um, department stores, including Bonwit Teller and Worth's. Uh, in addition to her business success, she also had some regional fame. Uh, she was commissioned by name by John Glenn's wife uh, to create, to design an orbit dress for after John Glenn successfully came back to Earth all the parties that she was going to have to attend, she wanted a rose cherubini dress. Uh, she designed, fitted, and sewed a gown in two hours on live television. Uh, and she won a competition for creating a dress out of burlap. And apparently her winning entry involved it being a, a hot pink number. I couldn't find a photograph, unfortunately. Um, her designs were featured in national, regional, and local fashion shows of all sizes. This includes uh, the local high school, all the way up to the nursing homes, all the way uh, to real established um, uh, fashion shows all throughout Massachusetts as well. And she continued to do this all the way up until the 1990s. Um, a Boston gallery actually put on an exhibition of her designs in 2013. And so on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the Samsung galleries. Um, that was the exhibit that was put on in 2013. Um, and she lived to, uh, to a very ripe old age of 102. And um, finally passing away in 2016. Um, so Rose Cherubini is obviously a very interesting woman. If anybody knows the family, <laughs> I would love to get in touch with them to see if I can find out more about them. Um, similarly, I've been meaning to reach out to the Samson Galleries to try and see if, if I can get in touch with them that way, because she's definitely a very interesting individual. Moving on to sports. So Quincy has quite a bit of sports history, in fact, and quite a few uh, individuals who have uh, been involved in professional sports in a varying capacities. Uh, so we're going to talk about a couple of the women uh, here tonight. So first up, we have on the left-hand side of the screen, Mildred Wiley. Uh, she was an Olympic high jumper, if you can't tell by that picture. She won bronze at the 1928 Summer Olympics in Amsterdam. Uh, and apparently, she beat her personal best record at it, um, during that competition, which was one and a, uh, 1.56 meters. I don't know, I can't jump that high, so that's pretty good. Uh, another interesting fact about her is that she was also the mother of Bob D, who was a Patriots player. Um, so they were, in fact, related. In the middle of the screen, we have Mary Pratt. Uh, she was a pitcher for the All-American All Girls Professional Baseball League, which is very famous because a movie was made out about it called A League of Their Own. So if you've seen that movie, that is very much based off of the experiences of women like Mary Pratt. Uh, Mary grew up in Quincy and attended Boston University, uh, earning a degree in physical education. She then left Boston, came back to Quincy, and started teaching in Quincy Public Schools in 1941. However, in 1943, she got recruited by the Rockford Peaches out in Illinois, which was, like I said, part of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. And she played for them for one season before getting recruited by the Kenosha Comets, Comets in Wisconsin, where she uh, led the team to a league championship uh, that year, and including p pitching a no-hitter. Uh, she retired from baseball in 1947 and returned to Quincy, where she continued to be a physical education teacher at Quincy Public Schools and Braintree Public Schools uh, until roughly uh, 1986. And unfortunately, she died just a few years ago um, in 2020. And there we go. I was going to say, is anybody, does anybody know, know her here? Yes, so we have a few, a few people. Excellent. 
Yeah, so Mary Pratt, you know, very, very fondly remembered by a lot of people here in Quincy. Then on the right-hand side of the screen, we have Karen Cashman. Uh, she is an Olympic speed skater and won the bronze medal at the 1994 Lillehammer Winter Olympics uh, in the 3,000-meter uh, short track relay. So like I said, we have so many tremendously accomplished uh, sports, uh, sportsmen, sportswomen here in Quincy, and here's just a few of them. So we also have quite a few writers in Quincy history. Uh, the first one on, this, on the slide that I do want to talk about, this was a woman who has re very, very, very recently come to our attention as someone who was actually buried at Mount Wallison Cemetery. And this is Harriet Wilson. Um, she is an author. She is, in fact, the first African-American to publish a novel in the United States. Um, and she is buried right here in Quincy. Uh, she spent her final years here. Uh, she didn't spend a lot of time here, but she is, like I said, in Mount Wallston. Um, her book is titled Our Nig, uh, or Sketches from the Life of a Free Black. It is semi-autobiographical um, and goes into some of the details about her own life with some, you know, possibly um, changes, certainly changes of name, some, you know, dramatization of, of her own life story. Uh, so Harriet Wilson was born in New Hampshire uh, to, uh, and was actually orphaned at a very young age and so had to, was then indentured as a servant until her 18th birthday to uh, pay for her upkeep to uh, the Hayward family uh, in, in uh, New Hampshire. Now, she, by the accounts that she talks about in her book, she endured some really terrible uh, treatment and conditions, like you know, very abusive uh, uh, beha uh, behavior from the Hayward family. And after leaving the Haywards, she worked as a domestic servant and as a seamstress. Um, she got married in 1951 and had a child, but her husband actually ran off and abandoned them. So she had to put her child into a poor farm while she worked to uh, support him. And this was actually the point when she wrote her, her novel. Um, she wrote the book in the attempt, and it says at the very, very end of the book that she was writing this in the, uh, to try and, and raise money so that she could get her, her son back. Uh, unfortunately, her son died before she could succeed. Uh, the book didn't actually sell very well at the time because uh, it dealt with some very uncomfortable truths, uh, namely that the, the, the conditions that, that African Americans in the North had to put up with, um, while not enslaved, they were not very well treated, and especially um, abolitionists, they were more focused on getting rid of the institution of slavery, and so they didn't want to pay attention to what um, African Americans up in the North were having to, do, to deal with. And so it just, it was not a popular narrative to be talking about at the time. Um, now, after her son's death, she actually moves to Boston and becomes inv heavily involved in the spiritualist movement. So the spiritualist movement, for those who are not aware, it arises after the Civil War, primarily, and kind of is a natural reaction to the amount of death and destruction um, and loss that families are experiencing. And it has to do, it's essentially a religious and, and social uh, movement that is, uh, prioritizes the sort of communion and, and talking to uh, with spirits uh, in order to you know, further certain social goals as well. It's, a, it's very, very interesting. Um, and so Harriet Wilson actually worked as a medium, um, channeling messages from spirit guides and providing lectures uh, in the Boston area and New England in general. She was well-connected within those organizations and does manage to find some success there. Uh, over time, she progresses to working as a clairvoyant physician and, uh, and as a nurse, even selling um, a, her personal recipe for hair ointment and um, even begins making house calls. And so this might be a clue into how she ends up in Quincy, which will make sense in a moment. In these years, she starts a spir spiritualist Sunday school for children, uh, which only goes on for a few years, but um, does have some success. Uh, she ran a boarding house on Village Street in the South End at the same time as well. Now, in 1897, she moves to Quincy and is living with the Cobb family and is listed as working as a nurse. So it may have been, we, we can't find out much, more, much information about the Cobb family, but they may have been active in the spiritualist community. Uh, one of the family members may have had an ailment that she was treating, and so that might have been uh, her connection uh, to Quincy. But in 1900, uh, she dies at Quincy City Hospital and ends up being buried in the 
Cobb family plot, which is in Mount Wollaston. Now, fast forwarding to 1982, Henry Louis Gates Jr., the very famous historian, uh, <laughs> completely by accident wanders into a bookshop, finds her book, and realizes that this will revolutionize the understanding of literary history for, Af for African Americans. Um, and he manages to prove that she was the first published uh, African American author uh, of a novel. Before then, you had had other books published, usually slave narratives, uh, but apparently no other novelizations uh, were published before her. Uh, on the right hand, or excuse me, on the right hand side of the screen, we have Elizabeth Ogilvie. Uh, she is also a novelist, also a writer, and very famous for stories that were set in coastal towns of Maine. She likes uh, talking about that. She's kind of Stephen King, but a little bit more wholesome. Um, so she grew up in Wollaston as well and graduated from North Quincy High, but never attended college, but was still a very prolific writer. Published her first novel in 1944, which was called High Tide at Noon, which you can see the, the uh, film adaptation of that or from the, the billing there on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, she wrote 46 books in all, including an autobiography. And as I said, several of her books were adapted into movies. So she, all in all, she was a very successful author. And of course, we can't talk about Quincy women without talking about Ruth. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, actresses from Quincy. So we have, of course, Ruth Gordon. Um, she grew up in the Wollaston neighborhood graduated from Quincy High School in what is known as the worst graduating class of all time, and it produced uh, such failures as Ruth Gordon herself and Howard uh, Johnson, the founder of the Howard Johnson Company. Of course, I'm using the word failures uh, sarcastically. Um, she was extremely successful. She actually started appear first appearing in silent films in 1915, um, but also started making Broadway appearances. Uh, and she continued acting all the way up. At the age of 19, she acted all the way up into her eight, late 80s. Um, she was never without uh, a role. However, she is best known for her role in Harold and Maude as the titular Maude, of course, and for uh, her role in Rosemary's Baby as uh, the mother-in-law, I believe, uh, which she actually won an Oscar for Be Best Supporting Actress for that performance. Um, she was also a, in addition to being an actress, she was a prolific writer. She had a number of screenplays to her name, produced a number of other movies, as well as several um, nonfiction books. Uh, she wrote her own bi autobiography as well. Also, uh, complete, a very, very successful writer and actress. I'm going to grab some water one moment. I've been talking for a while. <laughs> Much better. All right, moving on to Lee Remick. So Lee Remick, of course, um, is also an actress, grew up in Quincy, and is the daughter of Frank Remick, the proprietor of the Remick's department store. I'm sure all of you already knew that. So she also started acting at a very young age, around 18. Uh, and some of her most memorable roles were in the movies Anatomy of a Murder, the Omen, um, Days of Wine and Roses, for which she was nominated for an Oscar, uh, The Europeans, a number of others. She also was never without work. Um, she was on tele, both she and Ruth were always on television, on Broadway, in movies. They were always, always, always working. Her final role was in 1989, and she re retired due to her failing health and unfortunately died uh, soon after. And then last but not least, we have Clara Blendick. Um, that is Auntie M, in fact. Yes, Auntie M is from Quincy. <laughs> there you go. We, we learned something new today. Yes, so um, Clara Blandick, she was actually born in Hong Kong, believe it or not. Uh, her father was a ship captain, and so um, he changed jobs or changed ships not long after she was born. And so the family ended up settling in Quincy, so she went through the Quincy public school system. And of course, she is best known for her role in, as Auntie M in The Wizard of Oz. Um, Unfortunately, her career was nowhere near as successful as Ruth Gordon or Lee Remick. Um, she kind of mostly was getting character actor parts or bit parts in, in things. Um, financially, she had a lot of struggle in her life, and, and um, health-wise, she always had a lot of struggle, too. So she, she unfortunately had a very sad personal life um, and ended up um, and, and died in 1962. So it's just kind of a very sad life, but obviously very beloved as in her role as Auntie M. 
And then the last individual that I want to highlight here is Celestine Dorch. Um, she is an art, a very accomplished artist, and she was also the first African-American teacher at Quincy Public Schools. Um, she was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and her family moved to Boston in 1920 um, so that uh, the family could be close to the daughters as they're going to college. Um, Celestine attended Boston University to study art and really excelled there. Um, she started frequently early and frequently started winning prizes for her art abilities and had many of her pieces featured in curated shows, including an a show that was entirely curated of her, her own work. Um, in 1954, she applied to, for an art teacher position at the, center, at the Central Junior High School, um, which was a new program that was being implemented for artistically gifted students. Uh, and the superintendent at the time chose Dorch uh, based on her talents as an artist. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we don't have these paintings in our collections. I actually found these listed on Etsy and they had already sold, <laughs> so we could not receive them. So unfortunate, but I, I was able to at least get these copies of, the, of, of some of her paintings. So those were um, scenes from the Hudson Valley uh, done in 1941. Uh, as a teacher, she you know, was beloved by her students and, and uh, went on to lead a class, field, uh, class trip to uh, Central America so that she could study, or so that they could study their art. Uh, she was very intrigued by uh, especially Mexican folk art. Um, and when our, again, Wayne Miller, the editor of our newsletter, newsletter put together a article about her, he started compiling uh, remembrances about Celestine as a teacher and just received countless number of just praise and, and how beloved she was uh, by the community. So that brings us to one of the other reasons why we are here tonight, which is to talk a little bit about what's going on next at Quincy Historical Society and, and what we're planning to do with all of these stories and all of these remarkable individuals that we've been uncovering and talking about tonight. Um, so. As I'm sure you are all aware, because you seem to be interested in history as a group, uh, that Quincy's 400th anniversary is coming up next year in 2025. Uh, so Quincy Historical Society has some big plans uh, for that year. Um, in, in addition to the lectures and projects that we already have ongoing. So this includes uh, a refresh of our permanent exhibit. So we're going to be redoing the exhibit, bringing it up to date, um, putting in some new pictures and being able to bring in some new stories, uh, finding ways to, to tell the stories that we already have in our exhibit, but do so in different ways, bring in new information, um, bring in new individuals and high, and that perhaps have not or need some more attention in the community. We also have a, an immigration project that has been long stalled, but we are, we're really wanna get it done uh, for the 400th, talking about the sort of classic period of immigration, so starting in the uh, mid early to mid 1800s and going up until about 1925 um, and talking about the various immigrant groups that came to Quincy and where they settled and why they settled and why they came here and, and, and exploring a little bit more into that because that is history that has not been done yet. Um, and then it is also the 100th anniversary of the Howard Johnson's company. And so we are going to be writing a book about the history of Howard Johnson's. Um, there are also a number of city projects going on. Uh, we know that there were, it was announced that there's gonna be uh, an expanded signage campaign around the city at historic landmarks, so that as you're going around, you know, people can find out more about the history in your own backyard uh, with that. Uh, and a number of, and they'll be having a number of events as well. Um, so how can you help? Uh, honestly, what, we're look, what we really need uh, a lot of the time is Photographs, we love photographs, um, especially if a family member of yours owned a business in Quincy and you have photographs of that shop or you know, people stand, or you know, some event that was going on in Quincy. We love photographs, especially if you know who's in them. Uh, we, this makes our job a lot easier. So if you are going through your old photos and would like to even just give us a digital copy, we would be much obliged. Um, because this is a huge part of what we do is, is gathering these photos and we can't do that without donations of them. Uh, journals are also, primary sources like that are also priceless. Um, we don't have many and people often don't think, well, you know, my, my grandmother wasn't anybody important. Uh, the historical society is not gonna be interested in that. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Um, 
We're also interested in family stories. So if you know of individuals, for example, significant individuals in your own family's history or that you know of that you haven't heard us talk about, give us a call, let us know so that you know if we haven't heard about it, we can start following up and learning more. And then also the best way to really support us and to help us continue this work is to become a member. Um, it really is through our membership that we are able to do what we do and you know, I can have a job that I could do these wonderful presentations. Um, so thank you to everybody who already is a member and please continue to be one. And for anybody who isn't, please consider becoming one. It's only $25 a year. We're pretty cool. You, you clearly want to support us. Um, and I just want to finish tonight by, you know, this presentation mainly focuses on individual women that have had a remarkable history and really stand out in certain ways. However, none of those women did it, did it alone. They relied on their networks. They relied on their communities for support. And so I just want to take a moment to recognize the women whose names don't get recorded in history very much. You know, these are the mothers, sisters, aunts, grandmothers, daughters, teachers, mentors, domestic workers, just the people in the community who have made Quincy what it is today and really support it and keep it going. And, you know, these are the people that you know, make it so that these remarkable individuals can thrive and that, you know, going forward into tomorrow, into the future, you know, this is why Quincy is really rem remarkable uh, because we have a community that really does care about itself and about, about its history. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh,